So what we're going to be starting on this week, it's the last session of class, which is involving how microorganisms are going to interact with host. And to introduce that part, I would like to bring in the, push, the issue about symbiosis. So when we think about symbiosis, we're talking about an interactive process in which two different species, two organisms, um, are going to interact to allow one or both of them to do something where neither alone could be able to do it. And we have many examples of symbiosis in the microbial world. So, for example, we have mammals and microorganisms. All of us, as we have discussed, we have microorganisms in our gut, um, either in the rumen, like in ruminants, the cecum, which is the hind gut, um, in horses and rabbits, and of course, uh, our own intestines. We, when you learn about the quorum sensing, um, you learn from Dr. Bassler about the squid, in the squid, the squid, uh, symbiotic relationship with uh, bacteria, but there's also other fish that had similar, um, similar bioluminescent organs to allow microorganisms to, um, to live there, and they benefit both of them. We have insects. We're going to be looking at termites, for example, in which those termites have microorganisms in their gut, and actually the bacteria are symbiotic with a protozoan, and the protozoan is in the gut of the termite, so it's like a symbiosis of a symbiosis, to allow them to digest the, um, to allow them to digest the cellulose that the termite is eating. We're going to see that funguses and microorganisms interact to form the lichens that uh, we see stuck to rocks, and together they both are able to thrive, and we're going to take a look at how plants and microorganisms, either because of the nodules that are being formed in plants by rhizobia or by the microorganisms from the Frankia group. And we're also going to look at how some plant and fungi are going to interact to allow for the better absorption of nutrients through the fungus to the plant. Those are going to be the mycorrhizal symbiotic systems. So now when we look at these relationships, we can categorize them into different parts. When we're looking at this, symbiosis, it's the relationship of two organisms. That doesn't tell you the nature of the relationship. When I was an undergrad, we used to attribute symbiosis as being beneficial. But parasitism is a symbiotic relationship. And parasitism is a relationship in which it's detrimental to one of the organisms. So let's just go down this list from this table that I got from a different book that displays some of these relationships together. And let's start by mutualism. When we're looking at mutualism, when you look at this table, you're going to have two organisms. Here, number organism A, organism B. And underneath that, there's going to be a plus, a minus, or a zero. The plus is going to indicate that there's an organism gaining. The minus is going to indicate that there's an organism that is being harmed, and the zero means that the organism is not being affected. So when you look at a mutualistic relationship, that relationship is one in which both organisms benefit from the relationship. We have a mutualistic relationship with the bacteria in our gut. Corals have a mutualistic relationship with the Susantelli in their organism. The Susantelli are able to use the light to generate the sugars that the corals use. And that's why the corals are beautifully brown. When the corals suffer from bleaching, it's because they have lost that symbiont and therefore they begin to die. So that relationship, those two organisms are going to uh, benefit from it. And it could be an obligatory relationship. Some of those are obligatory, meaning that they cannot live with one another. Other ones are going to be beneficial, but it doesn't have to be obligatory. The bacteria that we already talked about, the rhizobia, are able to, free, to live freely on the soil. But it, is, it will establish a symbiotic relationship of mutualism with the pea plant, for example, any of the legume plants. And because of that, the pea plant gets the nitrogen fixation that is going to help it to thrive. So those two things are intertwined. Now, synthropy is another uh, relationship that is beneficial, but as we have talked before, it's a relationship in which you're talking about a food reference. So, for example, the fact that you have 
the methanogens, which are taking the CO2 and hydrogen from the fermentation product of one organism and using that to respire, that indicates a syntropic relationship between those two organisms. So it's a relation based on food. You also have commensalism. And as you see, commensalism is one in which one organism benefits significantly and the other one is not harmed. The bryophyte plant that likes to live in the tropical trees does not cause any harm or benefit from the tree. But by being on the canopy above the, uh, the ground, it's able to be exposed to better sun. So that is a commensal relationship. So this relationship exists between two organisms, either because one of them is able to obtain food, it's going to be protection, it's going to get some level of benefit, but it's not going to benefit or harm the other organism. That is opposed to parasitism. Parasitism is a relationship in which one organism benefits to the detriment of the other. Ticks are parasites. They benefit on the detriment of the dog that gets bitten. So this relationship, one, either lives in it, is intimately associated, intimately associated with, either because it's getting food or some benefit, but as, as a result of that, it's going to harm the other organism. And most viruses are parasitic. They are not benefiting, usually, the host. So we tend to think of them as parasitic relationship. Either because they're going to directly kill that organism, or somewhere down the line, that other organism is going to experience some detrimental effect because of that. Now, the last two is going to be competition, in which now you have more or less an active demand by two organisms. And as you can see, in competition, both organisms do not benefit. They're going to gain some level of harm because they're either competing for some environmental resource that is in excess, that is not usually in excess supply. Something is limited, so therefore they are very antagonistic to one another, which is another kind of relationship which you need to bring into, antagonism. So that is the sum of the mutual interference between the similar organisms in which one of them doesn't benefit, but the other one is harmed. Notice the difference between competition and antagonism. I am going to make your life miserable. It doesn't benefit me, but you're not doing anything here. That is antagonism. Whereas in competition, both organisms have harm happen to them. So what I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture is to look and bring you some of these relationships between microorganisms. And the first one that I want to look at is the carbon cycling in ruminants. And here is my little joke about past the crash. So again, ruminants are, my, are organisms that includes the cow, the goat, the sheep, deer, camel, elephants, buffalo, giraffe, elk, moose, etc. They all have the rumen, which is a distinct organ set during the genetic through their digestive system. That is not the same as the cecum. The cecum, the rumen is a four-gut organ. The cecum is a hind-gut organ. So the rumen is usually at the beginning of the digestive system. The cecum is at the end of it. Rabbits and horses have cecum. And you have, if, if you ever had a rabbit, you see the rabbit eating their own poop. Right? That is because they are recycling the material that is coming from the hind gut back to the system. And if you had seen a cow or a goat, you always see them chewing. Because now they're doing the same thing, except that the uh, material that is coming from the rumen is going back to the mouth to be remasticated. So you have to recycle the material. And the thing is, is that, as I mentioned, the rumen is that very large initial compartment of the digestive system. And that food gets regurgitated by rumination. So we're going to be seeing the organisms eat what they call a scud, which is the chewing material that has been processed through the rumen. Now the rumen, as a microorganism place, is a bioreactor. It is a place that is anaerobic in nature and is going to allow fermentation to happen. And here what we're going to be having is the fermentation process of cellulose, 
and all those materials found in plant foods, notice that all these rumen creatures are grazers, they're eating some plant food, and through fermentation, that cellulose will be broken down, and eventually, by serial fermentation, the collaboration of fermenters in which a fermentation product of one microorganism becomes the electron donor of the next one, and the carbon source of the next one, you go until you get to the methanogens, which are going to remove the hydrogen and the CO2 at the very end. So the cellulose is going to be broken down by a combination of the digestion between bacterial and protozoan symbionts. And amazingly enough, all these animals are obligate symbiotic relationship with their bacteria. You remove the bacteria from the rumen of the cow, the cow will starve and die. Because the bacteria is what's doing the digestion of it. We cannot digest that food. Remember when we talk about fiber? What we consider fiber or are all the cellulose components that we take in our roughage. And we excrete that relatively undigested. The cow, on the other hand, is going to absorb that through the fermentation, as you remember from the fermentation lecture, this is where everything comes close circle, it's going to be in the form of volatile fatty acid. And those volatile fatty acids will be absorbed to the intestine. Now, when we think about the food that these animals are consuming, they're eating grass, they're eating hay, they're eating straw, all the leafy materials. And as you know, they're composed by cellulose, which are monomers of uh, is a polymer of glucose, and it's going to also have xylan, which becomes from the sugar silos, or fructosan, which is from the sugar fructose. So very long, multi-polymeric um, um, compounds. And the thing about it is that they cannot be digested. Our stomach acid cannot digest cellulose. It doesn't do it. So the animals don't digest it. So in order for cellulose to be broken down, it has to be broken down through the process of carbon cycle that we have discussed already, where the exoenzymes are secreted by those microorganisms to break them down, and from there, those monomers get fermented, and get fermented into byproducts that are going to then be fermented by other organisms. So as I mentioned, cellulose is going to be resistant to the digestive tract because it's very stable. It's a linear chain of covalent and leg glucose residues, and therefore it's not going to be digested out by the stomach acid. It's extremely unsoluble. That's why we excrete it as fiber. And one glucose, uh, excuse me, one of those polymers have about 6,000 to 16,000 glucose monomers. Think of all the ATP that can be harvested through fermentation from 16,000 glucose units. It also forms these microfibrils, which are crystalline structures. So the composition of cellulose plus the fact that it's insoluble makes it very difficult to be digested. And these little fibers, again, they're very long, between 200 and I mean, 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter, and about 2,000 sugars per molecule. So there's a lot of that. Now, so what is the answer that nature has given is Betsy. So here you have Betsy the cow, and Betsy the cow has that rumen, the goat has the rumen, the giraffe has the rumen, the elephant, all these animals that are plant eaters, they have them, some reptiles as well, and that rumen is in a perfect environment for fermentation, 38 degrees. So the fermentation temperature, strictly anaerobic, is buffered by carbonate, so therefore the pH man is maintained. We're going to be, remember, what is the product of fermentation? A lot of volatile fatty acids. And as acids are, they want to bring down the pH, which can damage fermentation. Therefore, the carbonate, which as you know is alkaline, is going to buffer that environment to maintain it as neutral as possible. And as opposed to the closed culture system that we have talked about, it is a chemostat. Remember the chemostat is a system where food and nutri food comes in, waste and organisms comes out. So therefore the organisms in that or in that chemostat are always maintained in log scale. So they're always maintained in a log 
growth phase. They never go to the stationary phase as in a closed culture. Because food is always being added. Organisms are always being removed. So you always have that. So in here, depending on the organism, we're talking about a 25 to 40 gallon chemostat. How many of you brew beer? Think about 40 gallons of beer. That's a lot of beer, exactly. So I want to put it into that. So this is a fermentation bed that is huge. As you mentioned, constant input of nutrients, a constant mixing of the material in there to ensure that everything is nicely well mixed, removal and of toxic products and organisms. So therefore you have a, always a constant number of organisms. And urea provides the nitrogen source that it needs. Now, when we think about the rumen, the food is going to enter through the rumen first, as shown here in one. We're later going to learn about the omasum, which is a different part of the stomach in the cow. Then you have the abonasum over here, you have the small intestine, and later we can talk about the organisms that are present in the rumen. Now, I went to a big university in the Midwest for my undergrad in microbiology, and I often saw this around the cows on campus. This is a fistula, and the fistula is an open door to the stomach of the cow. So as this young woman over here in the picture is showing, she has a glove that goes to the elbow, so she will be able to go inside the room and take a sample and bring it out. The cow doesn't care. Yeah. The cow is happily living, growing, and having this fistula. This fistula is closed because, as we're going to learn, the fistula is also preventing the gas that is being produced during fermentation from escaping. But what we do in veterinary microbiology, and people that are studying this, is to have these windows to the rumen, so they are able to take samples of the cow. And those of you thinking of going to vet medicine, you're most likely are going to encounter this. So don't be going go, ew, like you're doing. Come on, guys. Anyway, so it's a port that you have to the rumen that allow you to collect the samples. Now, let's take a look at the organisms that are present. As we talk about, these are going to be obligate anaerobes. They're fermenting bacteria. We're going to have archaea, like the ones involving in respiratory methanogenesis. But you also have eukaryotes there. We have fungi and we have protozoans. All those organisms are present in the system. So they are going to be secreting by the mechanisms that we already learned in class. Of, they're going to secrete the exoenzymes to allow the initial digestion of those polymers into monomers that are going to be transported by those mechanisms that we learned in class. So here is when everything goes back full circle. Remember the mechanisms of export of those enzymes and the mechanisms of transport of those nutrients inside the cell because we're going to be using and talking about them again. So you're going to secrete, not you, the microorganisms are going to secrete cellulases, silanases, fructinases to be able to break those polymers. And now, since you have the monomers present, glucose, fructose, etc., etc., those are going to be transported in and fermented. And depending on the species, those could be fermented into lactate, succinate, acetate, propionate, butyrate, methane, hydrogen gas, and CO2. The important part is going to be methane, because the methanogens are going to close the gap. Remember that the fermentation process, if you give, if you maintain one of the products of a chemical reaction, that may stop the reaction from happening forward. So you need to remove the hydrogen from that equation to allow fermentation to be driven forward. And the methanogens are doing that. So the decomposition that are going to be happening in the rumen, it's going to be done by the microorganisms. But the microorganisms also are going to provide vitamins to the cow. They're going to be providing proteins for the cow. The cow is going to be able to digest those organisms. So not only is the cow getting the, um, the material from the plant, as the microorganisms are passed through the digestive system, eventually they also get digested and the organism, the cow, is going to get the proteins and vitamins that it also needs. So now here's an example of the rumen. And in this example of the rumen, uh, you see some very large starch granules shown over here. And as you can see from this SEM picture, you have protozoa, 
Look at this guy over here. You have plenty of different bacteria hanging around. So those microorganisms are doing what they do best, secrete those enzymes into the gut and allowing it to digest. So we have cellulose digesters. We have starch digesters. We have pectin and polymer degraders. Very different species of microorganisms that are able to do the digestions. And when we think about how many organisms are going to be present, we are talking that in the rumen alone, all of them is 10 to the 17 cells or about 11, 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 cells per mil. Now, these organisms, they're constantly being diluted out because the rumen gets empty through the process of digestion. So as the cow continues to eat, some of the food that goes from the rumen enters the digestive system, and as you are entering that in the digestive system, you're removing microorganisms. Remember, that's part of the chemostat analogy. You're removing waste and organisms out and adding more energy in the, in the form of food. So the organisms are always at a very uh, lag, logarithmic state of growth. So when we think about digestion in the rumen, um, the food stays there between 9 to 12 hours. Now, this table over here shows you the different species according to their fermentation and degradation capacity. So you can see at the very beginning, you have microorganisms that are cellulose decomposers. <coughs> Those are going to secrete the exoenzymes to break down cellulose, and when they ferment the glucose, as shown here in the table, they're going to give you succinate, they're going to give you some acetate, formate uh, in that species, other ones give you hydrogen and CO2, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I am not putting this for you to memorize every single one of these species and tell me how they ferment. More of an illustration so you can see that not one single microorganism is capable for doing all the fermentation and digestion. It happens as a community. You have starch decomposers that are going to give you other fermentation process. And as you can see, they have gram-positive and gram-negative microorganisms in both these populations. But for example, lactose is one of the compounds that is a product of fermentation. So you're now going to have lactose decomposers that are going to take that lactose and ferment it. And when they ferment it, they give you acetate and succinate, or acetate, propionate, and butyrate, for example. So the fermentation product of one species becomes the carbon and electron source of another through synthropy. That species will not be able to get its lactose if this cellulose or this starch decomposers will not ferment it. So you see that the product of the fermentation of one organism is going to be the food of the next one. Therefore, you can see there's succinate decomposers, which will take succinate and then propionate and CO2. Or you can see that you have meth the methanogens now are going to be able to take that CO2 and that hydrogen produced by all of these fermenters and use it to produce methane. So the process of fermentation in the gut of the rumen, in the cow, is going to eventually end up in methane production. And this great array of volatile fatty acids, which now can be absorbed through the epithelial of the intestine of the cow. And from those volatile fatty acids is what the cow uses for its nutrients. So again, let's take a quick look, I'm gonna bring it all together out, to show you the anatomy of the cow digestive system. And again, uh, I didn't really have an opportunity to put the new images of the book, which are a little bit better, so please uh, bear with me on that regard, and I apologize for that. So the first one is the rumen, and that is the fermentation vat, as I mentioned to you. And the rumen, it's the largest one of those organs in there. That's where the digestion of fermentation is going to be happening. You also have the reticulum, and that is the honeycomb part, which allows for the better sorting of the food. And those of you who love Mexican food, that honeycomb part that we are eating in Menudo, right? That is what we're eating. So it's the delicious part that makes menudo so yummy. So the omasum, it's the folded structure of the stomach. 
that is the one shown here in green, and that is going to allow to trap some of those food particles and able to squeeze and remove the water before that goes into the ovomasum, which is actually the bona fide stomach of the cow, with acidity that is going to then help to break down the nutrients that are coming in after they have gone through the entire digestive system. So as I mentioned to you, when we look at the fermentation process that is happening in the gut of your cow, you're going to start by having that feed or that hay that is rich in cellulose, starch, and sugars, and by the process of cellulolysis or amylolysis, basically breaking down of cellulose or breaking down of starches, depending if the cow is grain-fed versus uh, grass-fed, you're going to now have those sugars present. And those sugars are going to go through multiple fermentation process with a huge community of microorganisms that are able to ferment different pathways. That is why now the fermentation lectures come into play. Because you, you learn about all the, all the fermenters excuse me, that are going to give you an understanding of what's going on in here. So some of those fermenters are going to go again from sugar, from glucose, you get pyruvate, pyruvate to lactate, lactate gets used by some microorganisms to give you acetate, priorinate, and butyrate. These are the volatile fatty acids that are VFAs that can now be absorbed through the intestine of the cow. And from those volatile fatty acids, the cow is going to be able to make all that muscle that we love to eat as steak. So think about the fact that from the fermentation product of the bacteria, the cow now is able to take those fermentation products through its own intestine, and from there you get the muscle. So the cow cannot digest that cellulose. The microorganisms are digested that cellulose, and through fermentative mechanisms are going to produce the volatile fatty acids that eventually we benefit from in the form of the juicy steak that we ate last night. Okay. So those are absorbed through the large intestine and produce most of the energy for the microorganism. This is why this relationship is obligatory. The cow cannot break down this food product on its own. It has evolved, all the ruminants have evolved to depend on the microbial communities in a rumen to do that digestion. Okay? So you have either a carbon-2 acetate to a carbon-5 propionate, and those are the volatile fatty acids that is going to be absorbed. The cow continues to digest as bacteria to get proteins and amino acids and vitamins. And without them, those cow pies that we see, um, they get washed out and another cow is going to eat them to oftentimes reseed their own rumen with microorganisms. So now, as I mentioned to you, this is a picture that I found really amusing uh, from the net where this scientist is taking his hand out of the fisted, um, fistulated cow and then what you see is a stream, a jet of material coming out. Remember, that is a pressurized chamber. It's anaerobic but it has hydrogen, CO2 and methane. So all that material is coming out because the methanogens are there producing methane as the last. Without the methanogen, the entire fermentation pathway gets stopped because hydrogen is going to inhibit those fermentation reactions. And therefore, without that, the cow is going to starve. If methanogens are not present to remove the CO2 and the hydrogen in particular, the fermentation reactions will stop, the microorganism won't be able to ferment, and therefore the cow will starve. So the methanogens are extremely important because they lower the concentration of hydrogen in the rumen, allowing it to. So this is a syntropic relationship. So again, when we go back to the, ferment, to the respiration by methanogens, remember that the product of that fermentation is going to be hydrogen and CO2, either from fermented bacteria that are going to produce it over here or over there, depending on what fermentation pathway is going to be looked at. And again, I'm not going to spend my time talking about this because we already went in depth about it. So you can see this picture and compare all the fermentation pathways. But remember, <coughs> By either methanogenesis or acetogenesis, you're going to get methanogens to produce methane at the end plus CO2. So now, that methane 
that it's produced by the cow. I always joke that we need to have a cow put in front, have it to eat, and we connect a hose to the cow so we can have clean energy to move in our car. I would love to see that in Betsy, the cow. So it will be the cow power car. Because a lot of methane is produced. So, I mean, making a joke about it, it's true, but it's, it's a huge amount of methane produced biologically to the fermentation process. And that fermentation process, as we discussed, is happening in many different environments. It's happening in landfills. It's happening in wetlands, paddy fields. But cows are among the top <laughs> producers of methane. So the ruminants, not only the cows, all the ruminants that are running around the world are producing a humongous amount of methane. We have also a biogenic methane produces, like in mining, natural gas, etc., etc. But that is not as important as the uh, biogenic production. We're talking about 86%, quote-unquote, of the methane produced is biogenic versus 20-something percent of methane being produced abiogenic. Now, let's go back to those pesky termites. So here you have a termite, and what this picture is showing you is a termite, and here is a termite god taking out the termite and lay straight so you can see the entire thing. Three, basic, three different structures in that gut. That structure here, the structure here, and that one. When you read in the book, the book goes into more detail. But what I want to bring to you is that that termite has these protozoans in its gut, shown over there. And those protozoans in the gut have methanogens symbiotically living inside of it. So as the protozoans are fermenting, the methanogens in the protozoans are going to now do the methanogenesis to release the gas. And the termite vats produce a huge amount of gas, of methane gas, excuse me. Now, let's talk about mycorrhizae. And this is a relationship between a tree and a fungus. So when you look at this picture right here, there's a tiny little conifer. As you see, it's a tiny little tree. That's all that is, is for that tree. But look at the root system, quote unquote, that is inside. Well, actually, that's not the roots. That's a fungus. That is the fungus that is living with many of these uh, pine, spruce, oak, beech, and birch kind of trees. And that relationship is a symbiotic relationship between the fungus and the plant. And we're going to look that you have two different things. You have the ectomycorrhizae, ecto from outside, and then you have the endo from the inside, mycorrhizae. So myco from fungus, rhizae from root. Notice the difference between those two little trees, one of them without the fungus and one of them with it. Plant at the same time, except that you allow the infection. When we talk about infection from now on, it's the exposure of an organism to microorganisms. And it has nothing to do with being detrimental. The process of infection is just the exposure of one organism to another. We are all infected with bacteria. We were infected at birth when we came out of our mother's wombs. The plants are infected with mycorrhizae in this, in this case, with the fungus. So you have a lot of bad nutritional absorption. And as you can appreciate, when we look at that, the ectomycorrhizae, notice this is the root structure. Notice that the fungus are mostly outside of the root. And when the hyphae from the fungus penetrate, it's going in between the cells. So it's forming a sheath around the root. And that now allows the, micro, the fungus to ex, extend into the soil where they're able to absorb nutrients and pass it to the tree. They benefit both of them from the relationship. Now, the other relationship is the endomycorrhizae, which is the internal one. As you can see now, the fungus are going in the vesicles in here and now are using the xylem and the phloem to be able to know. So most of this is going to be the grasses, for example. So you have one infection, which is a vesicular ambusular mycorrhiza, because they're going inside. That will be the endomycorrhizae. And you have the ecto, which is the infection of it in the outside, and help the fertilization of the exchange of nutrients. So now, as you can see, 
two organisms working together as a symbiotic relationship. We talked about nitrogen fixation. Again, this is from a different lecture, but now let's bring the symbiotic portion to it. As we discussed before, and we did this in one of the lectures in class, microorganisms of the rhizobium, bradyrhizobium, azorhizobium, mesorhizobium, all those rhizobium means roots, all those uh, species are nitrogen fixating bacteria, and they have a symbiotic relationship with plants and some of those plants um, are going to be for example the soy, the clover, the beans, all of them legumes. That is the word that I was trying to think and it was not coming to my head. Now in the root system they're going to form those nodules. Some of the nodules have to be in the roots, it could also be on the stem. Depending on the bacteria, you can see stem nodules, which is root nodules. And that's where I'm going to spend the next um, the rest of the lecture talking about. Those nodules, as you remember from the nitrogen fixation uh, lectures, they are populated with bacteroids. Those are going to be a differentiated stage of the rhizobia bacteria. They do not divide. They do not move. Their sole purpose is to fix nitrogen for the plant. So they're going to be taking the gas from the atmosphere and fixing it as ammonia that can be used in the biological system. This system requires an active infection. And for that active infection, you have to have a recognition of the bacteria to the root. We're going to see that the plasmid, called the symplasmid on the bacteria dictates the tropism, basically meaning which species of bacteria infect which species of legume. So you have a recognition and attachment via the lectins on the plant and the right cat hearings in the bacteria. Now, you're going to have the secretion of some factors called the NOD factors, NOD for nodule formation. And those are secreted from the bacteria. The plant also is secreting factors to attract the bacteria to it. There's going to be an invasion through the root hairs of the plant by the bacteria. They're going to form a thread, and from that thread, they're going to migrate into the root through that infection thread and form a colony that is going to develop into bacteroids and the plant is going to make them a home, which is the nodule. So you have this um, relationship in which both of them are going to be working because the plant likes the fact that it's going to have the nodules present to it. So when we look at here, you have the recanary mediated recognition. So there is a recognition mechanism, meaning that you have a receptor and a ligand. So the bacteria has to have that ligand and the plant the receptor, and vice versa. This doesn't happen with any species, and that's why you have certain rhizobacteria that infect, for example, clover and not pea. There is a relationship about this, so a ligand-receptor relationship. As I mentioned to you, the bacteria is going to be releasing not factors that are going to cause the hair in the root to curl and they're going to create an infectious thread. It's basically a little road of bacteria that they're infecting the plant. Eventually, that infection is going to come inside the root, and once it gets to the root, the plant will give it a home in the form of a nodule. So the nodule is like a little tumor that the plant has made to allow the bacteria to live inside of it. And as we discussed before, the bacteroid doesn't have any cell division. There are some dormant rhizobial cells present there, meaning some vegetative cells, but there are very few. So if you remove them, eventually those cells are going to differentiate back and be able to swim and do their business and move. But they are nitrogen-fixing factories. All that they're trying to do is to take the nitrogen gas from the environment, create... Um, 
amine groups that are going to be able to be formed into amino acids and then give that to the plant. And the plant is given the process of the, I mean, the product of photosynthesis so this organism can respire. Remember, oxygen is detrimental to this mechanism. So the respiration is happening to reduce as much of the oxygen present. And you also have the presence of which molecule? The leg hemoglobin to remove and, re and, the, and uh, reduce the oxygen availability. Now, this symplasmid is present in all the microorganisms. Here is part of its um, structure. You have a lot of not genes present and some of the NIF genes present over here. The NOT genes are going to regulate the nodal formation. They're going to give the specificity to the host, so the bacteria can even fed P versus clover versus whatever all the other uh, legume plants are. The NIF genes are the ones required for nettling fixation. They produce, for example, NOT A, B, and C, which are shown over here uh, from this promoter to the right. So this arrow indicates the transcription directionality. So again, just like when lambda circularized, you're going to have from the not D, two sides, promoter right and promoter left. You have the production of these factors. And these factors are secreted from the bacteria, and they are now having receptors on the plant cell, and those receptors are going to trigger responses. So there is communication between the two species. So for example, you have an n glucosamine backbone, and as you can see, R1, there, R2, they are going to be different according to the species of microorganism that is spraying. So well, some of them are very, very large not factors, and some of them are quite hydrophobic. For example, carbon-16, that's a very large acyl group. Now, the other side, the plant. The plant is releasing other issues, flavonoids, as we call them. And here we have two different flavonoids, one of them that induces and one that inhibits. Now, not D, it's the central control system. And that is going to bind over here at the promoters. One promoter left and one promoter right. So it is going to control the binding to it when, the, when there is a relationship already with the plant because not the binds to the flavonoids that is, are being produced by the plant. So when the bacteria is in, con is in close contact with the plant, the flavonoids are going to bind to not D and once it's bound to not D, not D can bind and activate transcription from the plasma. If the plant is not in close relationship and there is no flavonoids, there is no activation of the not genes. So now you're having a plant product that is activating transcription in the bacteria. So both partners are working to establish the relationship. Well, I'm going to stop in there. The chapter has a lot more examples of symbiosis. I want you to make sure that you take a good look at them because, I mean, lecture-wise, I don't have the time to go over them. And I will leave you over here with the African termite moles, which are usually ginormous, they're about as big as I am, that are full of termites, which are producing methane.